25 years ago. Mm -hmm. They should be 25 years older. You know? <laughs> and uh, did you know, today, I blew up a courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you thought he'd be the one to like, you know, become like an alderman or a, a you know, representative or a senator, and sometimes it don't work out that way. <laughs> and Roger was the judge that sent him to jail. <laughs> There's two counts of everything against you, so go to jail! <laughs> Loser! <laughs> Just a fantasy. <laughs> and my whole world was that. I hated school, and uh, you know, I had all this junk going on in my head. I used to run around. I was a freak. I was tourating out voices and making noises, and uh, everybody was like, "Can you not do that? Can you shut up?" I was an annoyance. You know, I just wouldn't. I was like a little uh, entertainment machine. I learned how to play guitar. Every time I go. Uh, try to play a piano, they'd slam the lid. Can you not do that? You know, and as I felt stifled. I felt like I was being like squeezed to death because I couldn't express myself. And uh, that's really why I wanted to be in the business I'm in, is I wanted to be a contributor so bad. I wanted to come up with things that I thought um, that the people who hired me would love, you know, and you give them, I would always give them way more than they ever expected. And uh, every character I, I put a thousand percent of myself into it. I, I wouldn't, I deliberate hard and long about every character before I dared open my mouth. Um, you know, you think about what they look like. Um, Futurama was like that. Um, I was called into audition for all these characters except Fry. And, um, <laughs> and I just did what I thought. They showed me a picture of the professor, and I thought he'd be rickety. They said he was 147 years old, so probably farted in dust, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, I played it like that. I was physically shaking, which is a no-no in voiceover. But, eh, I was looking. Yeah. Um, and I would go, um, good news, everyone, <laughs> bad news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then um, they showed me a picture of um, Zoidberg, and I thought, well, geez, you know, he's big, and he'd be portly, so he must have a low kind of voice, but I thought, geez, you know, sometimes when you play against type and you make a voice come out of something that you never expected because of the way he looked, you know, you could do like a high little voice or something. But that wasn't the way to go. I, I, I looked at his face and he had all that junk hanging off his face. <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, it'd be really hard to talk, you know. So um, I gave him a marble mouth, like a couple people in show business, periphery. One was uh, Lou Jacoby. He was in the first Arthur movie. And uh, he was the guy that leaned in Arthur and went, what's it like to have all that money? You know, it says you suck. And, um, and there was this other guy uh, in vaudeville, like before there was TV, there were 12 acts that would play all day in a theater. You could pop in any time you wanted and pay, you know, 25 cents and stay all the, the long time that you wanted to. And he was like a toast guy, you know, he, you know, when he'd come out and go, you know the definition of a smart ass? A fellow that can sit on an ice cream cone and tell you what flavor it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so I cold fused the two of those birds, you know, it's like super collided them. And so you come up with like a Zoidberg, you know. You need an autograph? Why not Zoidberg? <laughs> Why not Zoidberg? Your music is bad and you should feel bad. <laughs> The thing that I thought was the funniest about that character was that he was a doctor and he was poor. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, you know, I've never met a poor doctor in my whole effing life. You know, and he, and he wore sandals. <laughs> and uh, and he, was, uh, he would insinuate himself into every situation like a bunch of people said, uh, let's go to that great restaurant. Come on, everybody. Zoidberg could eat. <laughs> <laughs> situation a few times, like, hey, wait for me, the little kid with the big kids running around. Um, 
And then, um, let's see, there was um, Zach Brannigan was a <laughs> Now, when I first, uh, when I lived in New York, I got a phone call. I was coming home from Manhattan. I lived outside of town. And my wife called me and she said, guess who just called here looking for you? I said, who? She said, Phil Hartman. And I said, geez, you know, you know, I know enough guys that can pull off a very elaborate joke like that and go, hey, how you doing? You know, I mean, because Maurice LaMarche and other people like that. And uh, she said, no, it was him. And he, he left a number. He wanted you to call him. And I said, geez, why? Why, you know, what does he want to talk to me for? So I go home and I call him back and there he was. And he said, I just wanted to tell you that I'm a huge fan of your work. And I... And I went, well, I kind of know who you are, too, you know? Um, but he was so generous of spirit to even do a thing like that, you know? He wasn't insecure. He was just very, uh, pick up the phone and call a stranger, basically. He got the number from somebody on the set who happened to have my number. And uh, he said, you know what, you ought to come out to California. So that's where all the studios are for a guy like you. You'll just go here, there, everywhere, every day, you know, Disney, Warner's, Fox, da 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 And um, so I finally moved out there and he said to look him up and he said, I'll help you get acclimated. And I couldn't believe that, you know, that, I mean, I was a huge fan of his, so I was kind of like, uh, I was kind of tongue-tied about everything. And we did a commercial together. We did an M&M's commercial. And uh, he played this a bad guy named Chalky Bar, and he was at a swimming pool and the sun was coming down, and I didn't have to worry because I won't melt, but Chalky Bar, the wise guy, uh, did. And, uh, and Tia Carrera was somehow involved in that. She was eating M&Ms and I jumped into a picture, you know, and she bit off my head or something. I told her about that. I said, you don't know me, but you ate me. <laughs> But yeah, um, Zach Brannigan was based on all these big, dumb, disc jockey announcer types when I was growing up, when I was a little kid. Um, these big voices, these guys, you know, this is Alex Dreyer. You know, and I said, these big voices, and, and other guys go, you know, coming to Worcester Centrum. And I go, what is he, what is he just like too cool for school? You know, he just leaves these pauses in there, like his voice is so that valuable. <laughs> You can't give birth to it? No, I can't. Uh, you know, like they were music. And it was a style, and I said, who talks like this? I could do it. You know, I could do it very well. Um, but I just always used to say, who, who the hell talks like this? So Phil Hartman, the reason I spoke about him was he was kind of Matt Branning and everybody wanted him to do Zap Brannigan. And I remember when I was with him, we talked about our love of big dumb announcers, you know? Like, he loved that too, these big guys. And that's why he always did those kind of voices. Um, okay, you know. And uh, I uh, remember, I was, I was, uh, I just moved to Hollywood, and uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, because my wife had woken up in the middle of the night, and she, went, she was like, looked upset, and she said, how can you be here? Everybody is just so evil. Um, you know, is there any good people? There's no good people that I've seen so far. And I said, look, if you're looking for them, you'll find them. There's plenty of people that will run right up to you and beat you up for nothing. But it's almost like it's a vibe you give off. You have to look, you have to, you know, like you look at certain people and you recognize their energy and it attracts you to them. And the same thing is going on with them. You were meant to interface somehow. If for no other reason, just to teach each other something. Maybe it's a failure, but you have, you've defined not by your failures. Um, I mean, success never taught me a damn thing. It was all the failures and attempts that taught me every lesson I, I really should know. And uh, that night, I said, you know what, there, there are good people. There are, I'll give you an example, Phil Hartman. He's one of the, He's one of the nicest, most generous of spirit guys I ever met in my life. And uh, I said, you just wouldn't believe, like, he, he's, so, uh, he's so creative and he loves creative people. And I said, that's the kind of person that you want to be around. And uh, the next morning I wake up to find out he was murdered. 
um, his wife splattered him um, in front of their two kids. And I was like, I was devastated. I was totally devastated. So they didn't want a future on it. They didn't want to do Zach Bryan again. And then later on, they just said, do you think you might want to try this? And I said, I don't want to sound exactly like Phil Hartman, like he would have done it, but I, I will try stuff based on all these big dumb disc jockeys that I grew up listening to. And so that was the voice that was happening. Carefully, the man. I've made it with a woman. <laughs> <laughs> She's a beautiful shepherd, right? I'm gonna fly her brains out. <laughs> yeah, what an a-hole. Applauding him. But I used him, uh, we began to notice that the, the Zach Rannigan kind of resembled the President of the United States. <laughs> Even with the hair and everything. So, uh, so it wasn't my idea. Somebody t tweeted uh, me and said, why don't you make America brand again? <laughs> and I said, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. I'll do, I'll do something, don't worry. And we were trying to figure it out. We just took quotes that existed, you know, that were on the record and just had Zap say <laughs> All true. I pay my wife a dollar a year and all the dresses she can buy. <laughs> you know, I mean, it sounds like he could have said that, like right out of the pen of the writers on Futurama. <laughs> like a great relationship with the black set. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was like too perfect, and I uh, broke the internet. <laughs> but if you were not, it broke the damn internet that day. Um, you know, it was just, it was just ridiculous. Uh, go Fefe. <laughs> It's like I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, he did some. He said some stuff recently that I wanted to just have Zap say. I gotta go look it up. You've been watching the Follies, you know. Uh, yeah, but, you know. Putin is a very, very, very nice man. <laughs> and meanwhile, he was. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, that's just another way of having fun with the DNA from Futurama. We just did a, a mobile app. It's a, a game, and it was number one on the App Store. And I played it, and it really, it's so cool. I'm not a gamer, but I, they said, no, you just take your finger wherever you want Fry to wind up in what situation, or you can just take off into space with them. You can do whatever you want. And I was like getting into it, and I said, uh, I, I don't even care if I win, <laughs> you know? It's just so cool to me. And uh, all this stuff becomes postmodern art. People used to get on me for reading comic books when I was a kid. I was a geek. It might be cool to be a geek now, but it wasn't 50 years ago, man. And these, the hard guys, you know, would chase you home from school. You know, they just like, they wanted to kill you or beat you up for some reason. Because, probably because I was artistic, I drew and I could play music, and I didn't, I really didn't fit in, and I felt disenfranchised, so I became my own little best friend, you know, it was like a little entertainment unit. If I want to, if I want to see something, I'll draw it. If I want to hear something, I'll just do it and say it or sing it. Um, it's, a, it's a very strange feeling, because at the very same time, I thought all of this is for nothing, it's worthless. Because nobody would give you props, you know? I'd sit home and I'd go, these bastards. I'm gonna go and show them something that I that, that I figured out last night. It's the coolest thing in the world. And I used to show up and go, "Hey, watch, listen to this." And I would do something, and they'd be like, "Yeah, no one happened." No. And I used to think uh, that it was nothing. It was just worth nothing. But years years later, I grew up and I realized. How I would have felt if some freak showed up in front of me and started doing, you know, spaceship noises and Stephen Hawking type sounds, and you know, and and I wouldn't, I wouldn't move either. I'd just stand there because I, I couldn't get my mind around it. You know, I'm not going to give you props. It's like you're going to be a constant and painful reminder of what these clowns never ever would be able to do in their life. And I just didn't realize it back then why nobody gave a shit. Like if you had talent. Um, and when I, uh, 
I graduated uh, high school and I went to, to study music at Berkeley School of Music. It wasn't a college back then, it was just a school. And then I realized I wanted to play music so bad and sing that I, um, I just left Berkeley. I just, I didn't want to talk about it, I didn't want to study it, I wanted to go out and play it. And I made a living with bands at a very young age. And uh, I got drafted in 1970. And, uh, you know, I got the greetings, telegram, and there was a draft lottery. It was up to, up to the 300s, like the days of the year. And mine was 30 because of my birthday. And that means they had my name stenciled on a footlocker. Um, I said, I'm, I don't, I really don't want to go do this, you know, because I knew it was an undeclared war, and, and eventually the world realized it was an illegal war. Um, so I, I mean, it's not like my patriotism was at stake. I didn't feel that kind of feeling. Um, but it scared the hell out of me, and I couldn't have passed that physical if I wanted to. I could have swallowed balls of tin foil, and, you know, and, and had it do nothing, or a tablespoon of linseed oil to give you a temporary heart condition. I heard of all the tricks. You know, like some guy would come in and pretend his arm was lame, and he'd go through all the things, a hearing test and psychological test. At the end, well, looks like you're out, and you throw a pen at you, and you go, <laughs> you're going. Um, so I had flat feet. I had the flattest feet in the world, and I had hypertension. It's kind of like a high blood pressure thing. Um, but anyway, cut to a million years later, turn right, um, to this very day in the Nixon Library, and it plays a continuous loop of all the stuff I did as Nixon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <That's a musical>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, somebody must have thought it was funny. I mean, and the reason I did it the way I did it is I don't think I sounded like Nixon, although I was well aware of him because I watched the debate on TV when I was a little kid. Him and John F. Kennedy. And what the Kennedy's people told the cameraman to do was extreme close-ups always on Nixon's face, where you could see hair growing out of his pores, you know, and sweat, and his hair was matted. And, uh, and there was Kennedy, it looked like a game show host with his perfect hair and teeth. And, you know, it was like the first televised debate, so image suddenly became everything. And then there's Nixon, you know, I want to be president of the United States. <laughs> you know, and I said, Mom, he looks like he's going to turn into a werewolf. <laughs> and, I, and that's how I thought of it, like, because I loved monster movies. I loved when Larry Talbot would instruct people, whatever you hear, whatever you hear behind that door, keep it locked. Do not let me out after midnight. And so I thought that's what's happening to Nixon. The reason I want to be the president of the United States of America is because I will. <laughs> it's true. I mean, you know, little kids have these great imaginations, and I just couldn't take any of that stuff seriously. It didn't mean anything to me. Um, but uh, it, it's really weird. I, I've been lucky throughout my life. I've met a lot of my heroes. Um, as a musician, I met, I met Les Paul once shook his hand, and, and I met Mel Blanc once, and that was a trip. I, I've gone to see him in the early 80s at an old wooden hall at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is outside of Boston, and there he was doing a slideshow and a, a, a voice display, and I said, there he is, when he came out, I said, there he is, you know, this little old guy waving, and I said, God, Jesus, I hope I get to meet him, and we did. But I blew it. Um, at the end of his thing, he said, thank you very much, everybody. And if you want to, he talked like that. If you want to uh, do some autographs, um, please line up over on this side, and I'll sign for you. And I got up, and I started body slamming people, checking little kids into the boards. Like <laughs> and he went, could you let the little kids go first? <laughs> was so embarrassing. But I did go up there and I did, you know, say hi to him and he signed some stuff for me and I, it was so surreal that I was like, I was um, 
spacing out. I was tripping, and I realized when I sort of got my consciousness back that I was staring down his ear. And I said to myself, I'm staring down Mel Blanc's ear. <laughs> Can you imagine all the stuff that went in there, and, and it, was, it was percolating in a, in a mind like his, and it came out through here? And I was like so excited. And I went home and I felt all inspired, but I realized that you know, I could do impersonations and, and I could imitate cartoon characters, but in voice, in the voice community or in the voice world, you're only going to be a footnote if you're a mimic. I, I mean, there's impressionists that are really, really great, uh, but I wanted to create original voices that no one had heard before. Um, and, you know, I, I waited for that chance. You know, I used to try to create characters of my own on the radio. Um, and I worked with Howard Stern for a while, too. Hey, Robin, I just farted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I learned a lot there. It was an eye-opener. That was a very cold, tough room. You gotta play, I had to play rough. You see, he used to use me as like an attack dog, like when a guest came in. Listen, Billy, Conan O'Brien's coming in here and I got nothing to talk to him about. So just attack him. <laughs> it's so against who and what I am, you know, but it was like role playing. And I had this venomous puppet that looked exactly like the guy who sat in front of me, who wrote like some jokes and one liners, you know, and passed them. And uh, when Conan came in, he was at risk of being canceled because he, he just arrived on the scene. And, and Howard <laughs> wanted to have a, a you know, a Conan O'Brien cancellation party or something for him, and he was all mad, you know? And then the puppet starts in him, and the minute he walks into the ring, I go, Conan no bye bye You know, and he, what? Like, you know, Conan no bye bye <laughs> And he said, hey, shut up! Like, he was arguing with the puppet. <laughs> you know, and I think that's where they got the, the comedy dog from. You know, the insult dog. Yeah, because this, this puppet was venomous. It was filled with insults. Um, you know, it, it was crazy. Uh, but then I, when I moved out to uh, California at the behest of one Phil Hartman, um, it was really, really great to do things. And I also did commercials. Um, I did the Red M&M. I still do. It's like, you know, an icon. You know, like an American uh, icon, I guess. And I auditioned with this other guy, I didn't know him. And he was good. And uh, a few months later, we actually met at the recording session. We had both found out that we were hired for the jobs. And uh, he was great. And, and one time when I came home from Hollywood, my wife was still living in New York. And I came in and she goes, come here. Before you say anything, come here. Look at this. And, she, and there's this show called Oz, the HBO show that was hardcore, it was like the prison show, and uh, she wanted to point out the worst guy in the entire prison is this white, racist, white supremacist, Nazi, uh, just the worst of the worst, and uh, she said, watch this guy, he's no actor, watch, what, look at this guy, he's the real deal, he's drawn on from everything from his real self, and I went, <laughs> I started laughing. She goes, what? I said, I know him. You do? Yeah, yeah he's the yellow m and <laughs> And so one day she came to the recording studio and I said, I'll introduce you to him. And she was coming up the hallway. <laughs> Afraid to meet the guy. And now you just see him everywhere. He stole the first Spider-Man movie as uh, J. Jonah Jameson. And he's in the uh, Farmer's Life Insurance, you know, insurance companies, the pedantic, uh, you know, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. <laughs> and, uh, but him as the yellow M&M is priceless. And, and you know what he did? He won an Oscar. He won an Oscar for a movie called Whiplash. I'm like, how? You know? And I knew, like, 25 years ago that he, he would be a national treasure. I just know it. I, I, I sense those things. And uh, there was, like, a backstage thing, and they were interviewing him. And he said, what's it like? What's it like to winning an Oscar? You know? 
how do you feel? And he goes, oh, I feel great, but there's, you know, this is, this is one thing, you know, but I get to work with Billy West. <laughs> I was dying. I was just dying. I was so flattered. It was, you know, um, I, I, I don't really have a sense of entitlement. I never thought that I was a big deal or that I wanted to be a big shit, you know, and I wanted to count money. I never dreamt in a million years that you could be famous or, or make money. I was just dying to bring something to the table. That was my motive. And I, and I still try to remain pure in the face of all the junk, you know, somebody laughing while they're stealing your shoes, you know, what are you gonna do? Like, you, gotta, you gotta stand up, you know, and then I would role play and I go, hold on. I gotta say, listen, you know, you guys are a dime a dozen, you're replaceable. I'm gonna pretend I didn't hear that. You know, and I role play, I become this like counter asshole. It was just fun to do, but I felt like, ooh, icky. <laughs> so I guess, uh, I guess at this point I could uh, take questions from anybody that's curious about this craft. I know a lot of people that I've talked to want to do like voiceovers. And... Yes? Um, so Futurama as a show, mm -hmm. everyone loves it, but especially recently it's become like a meme gold mine. Fox didn't see it that way. <laughs> You know what they did? They had a promo one time, and it said, uh, Fox Sunday night, 7 p.m. Futurama, followed by a new Malcolm in the Middle at 7.30, and at 8, an all-new Simpsons, followed by a new episode of King of the Hill. Remember, the fun begins at 7.30. <laughs> that, really, seriously, they did that. I was like, they, did, they had a strange relationship with that show. Um, and I just thought that, uh, you know, that the show was too good to not be on TV. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll take any little DNA from the show. We just recently did that project and we read a, a live episode of the Avalon Theater in uh, Los Angeles and everybody came out. It was just, it was so fun. They were all like, we were all friends. We all sort of knew each other even though we didn't, you know. Um, but the show cast members are kind of like family. You know, we always wind up working together on all other things that don't have anything to do with The Simpsons. Um, John DiMaggio told the producers of the show to put me on um, Adventure Time. <laughs> and what they did, they wrote it where Jake was sounding like a little bit like Bender. And the characters I did sounded a little like Fry and the Professor. And I said, are they, are they, they really, they want to do this? <laughs> Do it, just do it. It was nice of them. Um, so, yeah, and I have a couple of new things that I've been working on for over a year. Um, they're going to be announced soon, and they're going to be on Netflix. Yes. Um, you know, it was announced a while back that Matt Groening had a deal with Netflix. And there's something else. I don't think it's Futurama, though. I think he's doing a whole new show, which will be fantastic, you know? Um, yes. I know you. You were here the other day. Are you going to ask me the same question? <laughs> um, I just want to know, um, it sounds like you've uh, done a range of different characters over the years. Was there ever an iconic cartoon character that you wish you could have done the voice for? Um, no, not really, because I stand in appreciation of what other craftspeople, what other artisans do. You know, I, I'm in awe. Like Seth MacFarlane is very facile and very versatile, and I and I admire uh, how he jumps around like that. I think, <clears throat> I think that's my kind of stuff. I mean, I enjoy that, but I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to do that. I never like lusted after that. Ah, he's no good. I can do better than that. The guys who say, "Oh, I can do better than that," are the ones who attack me on the internet. You know, <laughs> yeah, you're nothing. I used to think you were funny. You're no, you're no longer funny. Thanks for that update. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, just want to say, you've been working on the future. Thanks. Uh, so for when came to recording the voices, was it just by yourself in the room, or were there like the other cast? No, mostly we um, recorded as an ensemble. Katie was there next to me, and uh, it was Phil Lamar, Dave Herman, Maurice LaMarche, Lauren Tom, Tress McNeil, um, you know, and John DiMaggio. And we used to record, because they need that vibe. 
you should just hear the shit that goes down when the mics aren't on, you know? When they, when they just stop and take a, a break to get to another scene or something, we just started riffing about whatever happened that day or whatever movie came out, and it was a whole comedy album. You know, because these people are really capable of, like, replicating anything that you want to talk about. Uh, yes? Yeah, you? So, um, what was it like working on Space Jam? Oh, wow. It's the 20th anniversary. <laughs> Space Jam. Oh. I um I played Bugs and I played Elmer Fudd in that and um and I got to work with Michael Jordan too, Doc. The closest thing to a religious figure that we have. <laughs> and there's a final word. Goodbye. Yes. Regarding that question involving your character you wanted to play, I actually heard rumors you wanted to play Bugs Bunny in back in action, but you were replaced by some unnamed show. Because yeah. even you know, because even though Don <coughs> Hayes wanted to make it Fable to Looney Tunes, I've heard rumors that Warner Brothers wouldn't give him any any, any creative control. Oh, it, it would cause the movie to suffer. Is that true? I don't know what went on. But I did do Elmer Fudd in that movie, reluctantly, because I, was, I had to be told that um, I wasn't going to be doing Bugs. And between you and me and the lamppost, I didn't create that character, so I didn't have this, like, covetous feeling about it. No one else can do this! You know, I mean, because I didn't create it, so I didn't give a dismal damn who did what. I had a job. <laughs> and Elmer Fudd was the one who got the reviews, you know, like, Unbelievable. Elmer Fudd sounded exactly like the guy that did it, and that wasn't Mel Blanc, that was Arthur Q. Bryan. But uh, I had to be told, and this guy meets me for dinner, and he goes, you were um, conveniently lied to? And I was like, I got so angry, and they said, but we want you to do um, Elmer Fudd, though. And I said, well, how about no? What if I say no? I don't need the money. You know, I just, I just felt like I wanted to... <clears throat> make somebody squirm. That's all I wanted to do because of how they handle things. If they only knew, I could care less if I had a starring role or not. That's not how I'm made, you know? I wasn't born like that. Um, I just had a job. I have immigrant mentality. It's like, I'll, I'll you know, audition for anything. If you want to work, you got to audition. And sometimes you don't get the edgy project and a cool project. Sometimes you get like you're the voice of a talking toilet or something in a commercial. <laughs> Well, you know, it's all part of the craft. I happen to think that's very cool. <laughs> it's like, I used to sit there and I'd go, I wonder what toilets think all day. <laughs> oh, here comes another asshole. 